Hello and welcome to the shop, Canadian pesos and what have you. Today we are disassembling a fuel pump. It's got this float and its own little standalone sealed container. On a lot of fuel pumps, this will be already installed. I don't know why this one isn't. This is just a hollow piece of plastic that's sealed enough so that it can float. These are just wires. I assume you understand how that works. I'll start by disconnecting some wires. There's a retainer. That didn't want to come out. That did. I'm not sure what's holding this pressure sensor on, but let's see. Oh, just the tension of the gasket. I think. Yep. There's a sensor. Let's see if there's anything under this sticker. Nope. Let's pull the second plug out. There's a plug inside there. It's got a blue retainer for the wires and these clips here. Oh, that broke right off. Good thing I'm not using this one. That one broke right off too. And these are brand new. Imagine how crusty those would get when you got fuel eaten away at them. Yeah, let's just break these right off. These didn't want to break. Why such inconsistent plastic, guys? There it goes. Good thing I'm wearing glasses because that bounced right off of them. There we go. So this is your fuel level gauge. This can rotate and this float sits in here. It's snapped into place. As the fuel level rises, it just pushes up. And this is a variable resistor. You can actually see how it works right here on the contact pad. There's a bunch of little tiny lines here. On this part that rotates a little bit, it's got two contacts that are connected. Notice that there's two wires here. The wire on this side leads to these varied contacts, and the wire on this side leads to this solid contact. One end of the power goes through here. It follows this resistor here down to wherever this happens to be. Let's say it's here, it's full, so there's a lot of resistance and it uses the amount of voltage heading back or the amount of power in general heading back to detect how much fuel is in the tank. And as this changes, so does the output. There's also a little bit on the end here that if this thing goes completely bad and does not send a signal from point A to point B, then there's a small high resistance bypass that'll let a trickle of electricity through, letting the computer know, hey, there's a problem with this. Just to show you the effect of this variable resistor, I'll test it out. I'm gonna plug these in, follow these purple lines to their corresponding plug points. It will be in ohms, which is a measure of resistance. When this is over here, you'll see that the contacts touch the area where there's the least resistance. They were at 42 or 43, and then it builds up as it goes higher, all the way up to about 250. And if we go in here and completely disconnect that contact, you can see it goes up to above 300 and doesn't change when you move this around. That amount tells the computer, hey, something's wrong with this, don't trust it. Because this resistor is always on, even if this is working, this bypasses the resistor, making it technically a short circuit. That's by design, though. There's nothing wrong with designing it that way. Let's see if we can get this fuel sock off. Yep. I'll look at that later, because it slid off the table. There are two holes here that the fuel tank filter attached to. One of them is obviously the pump. The other one actually leads through here up into the top of the assembly and opens up right here. All right, this assembly looks like 
This is a case that is snapped on here and here. There's one, there's the other. There we go. All right, now we're into the guts of it. This is the fuel pump itself, this metal cylinder here. Inside here just has some channels. Down in the center is where the pump goes. Over here is the other tube that I showed you earlier. And there are various lines of plastic heading down the length of it that are just there to keep this thing from cracking under stress. Probably mostly for shipping too, because once it's in the tank, it's kind of just hanging there and it doesn't really do anything. Here's a rubber piece that fell off. We actually saw part of that sticking through here, right in the middle earlier when we were disassembling it. There's also a kind of a one-way valve right here. That little one-way valve lets this tank fill, but not drain. We'll pull that off. There's the second filter. Two openings here and one up top for the main hose that leads to your engine. There we go. All right, I'm gonna cut this wire so I can use the plug. Now I've got leads for this pump. Whew, that's got some kick to it. I suspect this motor may be too big to do this with, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Yep, that's not happening. Guess we're doing it the hard way. Almost out. There we go. This is very soft metal. There we go. Wow, that is super light. That's definitely aluminum. I mean, judging by the look of it, it might be powdered aluminum. So we've got a plastic fan. There's not a whole lot to it. It's just tiny, tiny veins. There's a lot of them, but they're super thin. There's a channel in here where the fuel gets sucked into by this fan. The fan spins, pulls in fuel from the other side, which has the opposite channel to it. It starts out shallow and then it rotates around until it gets to this inlet here. And that's where the fuel gets sucked in. Come on, peel down, peel down. Barely making any progress here. Look at how it's almost the same all the way around. Oops. Well. Hmm. Whoa, that could have hurt. All right, I finally got this thing apart. There are the motor brushes. They both have individual springs to them. And there's the brushes, and here's where they contact. As with any electric motor, there's windings inside of here, but it's covered in plastic. Not a lot of electric motors have that plastic coating. This is an exception because fuel actually flows past this. This right here, I damaged it trying to get it apart, but this is the tube at the top. This goes to the engine. This is a little one-way valve. So when you shut the pump off, the pressure doesn't flow back in through it and it allows it to maintain pressure without the pump running. It's kind of like an anti-drain back valve in an oil filter, except with this, it's actively being used while the car is running. The motor will actually turn on and off during the drive to maintain a pressure range. With some cars, you can turn the key in the on position and it's getting ready to be cranked over and you can hear the fuel pump kick on and it'll stop. That's when it reaches the pressure that it wants to be at. It's not like it was on just to test. These are two permanent magnets which are not supposed to stick together they sit in there like that I found them kind of attached like that because I knocked them loose here's an exploded view of the basics of a fuel pump this is just the outer shell this is the first part of the inner shell this will spin moving the fluid this direction up through this and around 
to here. This also has a solid bearing sleeve. This is how the electricity is turned into spinning motion, which is how the pump ends up working. These permanent magnets are on either side of the motor. There are coils of wire around each of these, which are fed power through these. These brushes are what come in contact with it. There's a positive and negative. Inside here is the other bearing for this. There's wire in here that leads to this plug. This end ends up being plugged in. These wires were once attached to this, which leads to the top. This piece seals the wet electronics from the dry electronics. That plug also leads the wires to this variable resistor, which tells your instrument cluster how much fuel you have left. From this anti-drain back valve, there is a tube that leads the high pressure fuel to your engine. This is the lower fuel strainer. There's actually a one-way valve in this one. Internally, there's this one connected directly to the fuel pump. These little pads have two purposes. One being that it's so the bare plastic doesn't rest on the bottom of the tank. It also helps with the fuel strainer because it puts some gap below it so fuel can get underneath and above. This slides so if the tank is abnormal in any way, it can adjust for that. I imagine it's also designed to fit more applications than a solid one would. This is a cutaway from when they go to balance the motor. They can balance it front to back and obviously from one side to another. This one had kind of a wobble to it before they fixed it. So that's what's inside a fuel pump. If there was anything in the video that I missed or anything that you want me to go into more detail on, let me know in the comments. If you are curious about what's inside other auto parts, check out this playlist. I also have a whole bunch of other cool videos like this one where I test to see if fuel system cleaners are safe for fuel lines. I hope you enjoyed this video and thanks for watching it all the way through to the end.